We had an all-encompassing passion at GT Bikes, and I think it just kind of spilled over to everybody. You know, everybody who worked there was always excited to be there. There was a culture sort of in GT that was built around the expectation that winning is what mattered. You know, Richard and I, we were, we were at every bike race every weekend somewhere. You know, we all our career BMXing and into the mountain biking. As a company, it understood that R&D evolved from, from competition. Hey, we want to we sell some bikes, we want to win, uh, and we want to prove we got the best stuff out there. With Mountain Bike Action, we appreciated GTs because if there was one thing we could always say about the bikes is that they were durable because they were stinking built tough. There was a bunch of guys already racing, you know, these bikes downhill and everything, and there was already the rumbles about suspension at that time. Downhilling was its own had become its own world championship discipline. Cross country was its own discipline. It was very clear that a hardtail wasn't gonna do it, you know, in downhilling. And designs were just popping up left and right. I mean, it was a free-for-all back then. You know, G2 took immediate notice of that. And uh, once again, true to GT's culture, it's like, we don't wanna just be reactive to what's going on. We wanna be proactive. We wanna get ahead of it. We had brought Forrest into the fold and he was doing, uh, you know, some real high-end stuff for us, but we hadn't really finalized or had a suspension bike. Yeah, Jim Busby was um, hanging out in Laguna Beach with, he was riding with our riding group, the Laguna Rats, often. And Those guys were hard on bikes, for sure, you know, none of this namby-pamby like, you know, JPL, like, oh, look at there's a rock over there, you know, they were, doing these huge drop-ins back then. My whole life I've just wanted to fix things. Problem solver. I see a problem, how do I fix it? Why does that happen? And understanding why. He was actually a very good rider himself and he would always ask a lot of questions and observe and um, be very scientific about everything. Well, I mean, obviously travel, you're gonna be limited, you know, if you have something with that much anti-squat. Jim is definitely a bit of a mad scientist, kind of the, kind of the wacky professor thing. And Jim, he's... He's got a lot of stuff going on up there. Well, if the free wheel's spinning at this speed, it wouldn't in fact pull on the chain unless you were doing this. He was beyond where everybody else was. And I remember everybody just saying, God, he's crazy. He's an he's intelligent guy, right? Everybody, everybody's smart in different ways. He was on a bike doing test runs and he came bombing down the hill and he's yelling at everybody, get out of the way. <laughs> like, this guy's a maniac. He was just amazing, like the things he would think of, and he never stopped. I mean, that was that was my life, was just fixing things. I was going, man, this just, it's not right. There's something missing. I had a, a friend of mine, his name was Tom Cirillo. His son was Trinan Cirillo. Trinan called me up and he asked me, he goes, I've got this friend of mine, he's got this design he'd made. And he goes, could I bring it to you and show it to you? So Trinan came over a couple of days later and he brought Jim Busby with him. You know, Gary was kind of the, the, I don't know, the moxie, the character, the, what it was about. It, you just say Gary Turner, and that was Gary Turner. That was the bike, that's why it said GT. And Jim had made this bike in his garage, he kind of cobbled it together, he cut up some bikes, and made, took a couple of bike frames to make the one. It, no, it wasn't just kind of cobby, it was cobby. You know, because that's what, I just made things. And it had a rocker down by the bottom bracket, and when the chain stays would uh, pivot, and the, the top pivoted and the bottom rockered, and it would push the shock forward. 
I said, Jim, would you be interested in me setting up a meeting with me and you and Richard? I don't know, there was something about Richard Long. It was like, I don't know, a father figure, just someone that you looked up to. He always spoke in either double caps, but nothing ever came out of his mouth that wasn't loud. And it, you know, just some people are just driven to get it done. I go to GT and I am so nervous. And I had gotten Richard and Bill During and Diane Shaw. And all these people are in this room and they're kind of looking at it and they got Forrest's new bike up over here. First we go outside and, and ride the bike around. And then all of a sudden Richard, you know, his eyeballs got bigger than saucers and he goes, why didn't, you, why didn't you tell me about this? I said, dude, I've been trying to, you know? I said, I think this is a golden opportunity. So I go, look, man, I'll give you the bike if you just give me a job. No, there's no royalties, no nothing else. I just, I need a job, you know, and I got a kid and I, I uh, we live in a trailer. You hear, you can have it, <laughs> just do it. It was buzzing around GT, we're, we're gonna make this, it's gonna be awesome. You know, we saw it, again, because we all worked in the same building, we saw it getting tinkered with in the back and the early stages of it and everything else. And uh, the feeling was this was a bike that was gonna really kind of give our guys and gals the tool that they needed to be real, real competitive. At that point, the downhills weren't as gnarly, obviously, because we were on hardtails. And so that whole rocker system underneath the bottom bracket that you could pedal, that was a pretty big deal then because it smoothed out that. So you could pedal through some of that chatter and you could brake, like actually slow down in the braking bumps instead of shake yourself to the stop. The technology of the bike was cool and the pure seat tube, you know, and it's just like, oh, there's a lot going on there. And the whole rocker arm, you know, no one, that was, that was a level of sophistication there that nobody else was doing just yet. I think the biggest problem was trying to get it to work together. So the front and the back was matching because it was so much better than no suspension that really almost anything was better, but then once the shock started working for the bike, it's, it was great. Julie Furtado, man, I, 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 where do you start when you talk about Julie? The Furtado was just, just bold and brash, you know, the whole New York thing, you know, and just like, and just a, just a spirit animal. Maybe, maybe the most talented athlete I know, period. I came from skiing, you know, and going to college on a ski scholarship, trying cycling and winning road nationals and winning mountain bike worlds right when I'm graduating college, right at the ascent of the sport. And, you know, I couldn't have asked for a better sport to get involved with at that time and at that time in my life. One of a kind. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, my, words kind of escape me when I talk to you. Just, there's nobody else like, an icon, just an icon. Just look at her knees, just that alone, you're just like, good lord, like what are you, you can still ride a bicycle, you know? And I remember one time I talked about, oh, I have, I've had five knee operations, you know, and I've had these scopes, and she like, she's like, where? And I'm like, well, there's a scope here, and she just like laughed at me, and I felt like, I felt like about this big, because I'm talking about thinking five knee operations, and it's like, pfft. she's like, I'll get that done before lunch, you know? She's so tough, and that's, you know, as a guy, I'm just like, oh, God. Bitching, you know, I mean, it's like they don't make them like you in SoCal. I didn't go to world championships in Bromont in 92 because our our first child was due. Yeah, the cross country didn't go so well. I um, I dislocated my kneecap or my knee, I don't know, some, one of those things. And then I, I couldn't really paddle. Um, and so I'm pretty sure I dropped out. It was just this beautiful day up in Bromont, Canada. A sweeping view of this whole valley down to Quebec, everywhere, whatever, it was just, you know, Canada. And I had already done the qualifying for the downhill because it was actually really good downhill for me. Technical, but not a lot of air because I don't do air well. There was like real downhill racers from Europe that were there. I'd never ridden the RTS. It didn't seem like she'd ridden it more than a few, less than a handful of times. And in the qualifying, I had a flat. And so for the downhill, I was starting last. Zap was at the top, and we were just kind of joking around. It wasn't like she was <laughs> like on a wind trainer, you know, or going through the motions, doing push-ups or checking her bike. You know, we're just sitting there like eating a blade of grass, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, you know. I had to raise my seat because I couldn't bend my knee enough. Literally, the two of us sitting up there, and you get off in the background, you know, there's like, you know, three, two, one, the girl's going off. And I went and I had to pass about two people because I was back with the really slow people. Yeah. 
in 40 position. Penny Davidson now. 5.33. And I get to the bottom, you know, and by that time, you know, she, she had already, of course, finished across the finish line. Here's Julie Furtado. Yeah, I, I won. <laughs> Upset. They think they're probably already doing awards, because I mean, like I said, it was a big gap to when I came down. You know, they're thinking it's like, you know, ah, Furtado, what the hell is she going to do, you know? It was Missy Giovi and Giovanni. I don't know, whoever was at the bottom line pissed off <laughs> when they came down. Amazing. She's kind of amazing, though. She wins everything. So I was at the trade show, somebody came running up, and I remember pausing just like, what? She won the downhill? It was immediately followed by, I'm not surprised. It goes back to just Julie. I remember doing a couple practice days. We would do some of the cross country sections together with tree roots and, you know, good little drops and stuff, and she would just nail it, and I'd be like, whoa, she's got some skills. That's a testament to the quality of the bike and the handling characteristics. So she could just jump on it. The first time she'd ever raced a downhill was the World Championships and win. Like, oh my God. Like, it's making me want to cry right now because you work so hard to do something. And you want so bad for things you do to, you know, mean something to someone. It's like one of the greatest upsets probably in mountain bike history. I didn't know at the time that that would be one of the things people remembered me for is the fact that I won cross country and downhill worlds. Like I didn't understand the significance of that, and, but that is true today. I, I don't think anyone's done that. Just to be a part of something like that with someone of that stature is like, really? era from about 91 through about 94 it's like the it's like the beginning ages of flying where everyone was trying every idea imaginable and and half of them had no idea what they were doing there was also some early suspension designs from some of our competitors which were absolute um, BS I have to say you know racing was driving it but business was driving it. so some people just they wanted something that had a spring or a bumper or a piece of plastic in there just to say they were in the suspension game. Yeah, there were so many different principles of what a suspension bicycle could or should be that was sort of like, wow. There was a school of manufacturers who made bikes that felt good in the store when you pushed down. There was some movement and the consumer not knowing what to expect from a bike. And, oh, this, is, this, sounds, this feels good. There was more designs <laughs> that were terrible than not, and there was a real short list of designs that were actually any good in those early days. But when you took those bikes on the trail, not only didn't they work, but they were actually unsafe, unreliable, and it was crazy, you know, and there were literally pogo sticks, and people would get hurt in cases. There were tons of experimental bikes like that that um, people were playing with, but nothing that was really thought out like the RTS was, I think, really the first successful production dual suspension bikes. That was where the expression of mountain bike was back then. It's just like, yee-haw, you know? I mean, guys, whether you grew up on BMX bikes or motorcycles, and all of a sudden, you could kind of do the same sort of stuff on a bicycle. The GT RTS was definitely a landmark in suspension um, pioneering, you know, because it was a bike that delivered. From the RTS came the LTS. Things were growing up in a hurry. I mean, it was hyper competitive. I've grown up saying, hey, the stopwatch doesn't lie. I don't care what you're on. I've always looked at everything backwards, you know? I look at the result and the end, what I want, and how am I going to get there? What was a good design one year might, might all of a sudden be an old design the next year. The limitations of RTS, and we were in the kind of the rocketing evolution of mountain bike suspension at the time. And so it was, you're just always, you know, more travel, more travel, more travel. Is that the answer? I don't know, but we're going to try it. Some other people were coming out, and a lot of them were trying to emulate the RTS as far as just a pivot point on the bottom bracket. But we were already ahead of that. We were already light years ahead of that, where that would be, uh, in my opinion, the LTS. R&D guys evolved it out to an amazing degree by the time it was finally released. I mean, it was a beautiful work of art. And again, the design was like kind of loopy, or just like, wow, I mean, that's kind of crazy, you know, the shock up on top, and. 
the curves of the, the, the seat stays and I mean the linkage. Probably Jeff Socek gets the most credit for that. Aside from being a cool suspension linkage and everything, it was a really elegant design. But that thing, it was just the complete opposite of what the RT was in terms of the active suspension, you know? Back in the days, I was probably five or six years old. And I was jealous of my dad's bike just because I was riding next to him with my BMX and I was jealous of him, of his GT and LTS. You look at a bike like the LTS, and that had a shelf life of what, four or five years? That's a long shelf life for a suspension platform during a time where there's so much attention being put into improving on stuff. That was that bike to have for like five years, you know. The LTS was just ruling the full suspension world and it was a bike that worked. You think about what a team does. It's a, it's a marketing tool, it's a branding tool, you know, it's a validation tool, but it's an R&D tool. And at GT, um, our team was a, it was a bona fide R&D tool. GT was the number one brand. They always had the raddest equipment and the best riders. For me, coming up from through motocross, it was like the factory Honda of mountain biking. It was serious, it was professional, lockers, mechanics, fencing, you know, sandwiches. You know, there was other competitive teams, but they didn't have what we had. We had the best of the best in every level. Those guys were definitely, you know, the guys that everybody, I think, was gunning for during that time and riding the equipment that all of us kind of wanted to be riding. Uh, guys like Busby, you know, at the races, helping with tuning, you know, the guys actually designing the bike, they're helping the riders even go faster. A lot of engineers, they, they build a widget, they hand it off, and they'll wait to get some feedback on Monday morning. Jim wanted it on Sunday. The main three people that I was working with, like day in and day out, was you know Nicholas, Mike, and Mercedes. I came from motocross, so suspension and geometries and all that. I, it was like in my backyard. I completely understood the importance of it and how it worked. You couldn't have three different platforms or people that giving you feedback that could be any better. And Nico was just, I mean, just. Precise, man. And I remember hearing the stories, even from Mikey, you know, those guys, they would go over the World Cups. They were at this one section trying to figure out a line, and Nico came and took a line, or like, they were saying, it's like, we never would have thought of using that line ever. On top of, you know, Nicholas's just undeniable talent, he was a real student of technology. I mean, he really knew his bikes well, and he knew suspension well in particular. He and Jim Busby, they had a real strong working relationship. My King Ike! For me, it felt like a good luck charm because whenever we were at a World Cup race, I, I really felt like we could communicate and he could uh, translate what I was telling him on the bike. And, you know, we would tweak the setup here and there, whether it was good or bad, but we always kind of found that sweet spot. When it was when it was go time. He didn't just talk to the athletes. He gr uh, not grilled them's the wrong word, but he really went deep on what they were feeling, what they were experiencing, what they needed to make this design better, faster. You had the best riders, but then you know when they're killing you at races, you're like. You know, Mikey should be beating me at this race, but maybe not by this much, you know? So then it kind of, it kind of gets you in your head a little bit where you're like, dude, that, that bike must be working really good. A round of applause for our top five fail riders at the Quantic UCI World Cup. Bravo! the development of the GT downhill bike as it became, you know, I mean, from the RTS to the LTS, I mean, that was like a huge difference, you know, and you can't tell me that having Mikey King or Nicholas for you on those things didn't, wasn't, isn't what was like pushing Busby or anyone else in GT to make that bike better for the World Cup courses and everything else, and guess what? The guy, some stinking rat tat redneck on a GT in, in Moab was having a better time and a safer ride because of the things that were happening at a, you know, World Cup race, you know, 3,000 miles away. We knew that the LTS was a great design. We just, we always wanted more. It was really hard based on the location of the rear shock and the seat post. So at the time, I think thermoplastics, you know, has had a ton of potential. It was how are you gonna attach it to the hard points given the method of manufacturing. 
that bike, the carbon version of the LTS, was just on a technological level, in, just insane. I mean, those machined aluminum lugs, and you would draw draw that carbon tube through it, and then inflate it, and I mean, oh my God. I mean, not a lot of people know this, but that was probably my favorite of the frames that I rode. It wasn't very reliable. The characteristics were good. There was a compliance to thermoplastic that was real desirable. Quite frankly, though, you know, the early models of those things broke. When I first realized kind of the the limitation of it, if you're really going to push it. Now, if you're going to go ride around all day, the composite frame had a lot of good qualities. If I knew I had to kind of take it to the next level to, to make up maybe half a second by jumping either, you know, a big gap, um, I knew I could do it. We're in Panacosta, Spain. <laughs> he comes down and he's, and he's, I mean, this is a testing. 10 foot drop off. And that's being nice. It's probably more than that. And he ain't going to stop. And I mean, just slam it. And he comes in and I'm going, man, they're... And he, did, he kept going. But then those frames, they ended up failing a few times. <laughs> I don't know that they got raced in elite events too much because of a confidence issue. We just couldn't afford to have something break. You can't afford to lose a race. You can't afford to have a product from your primary sponsor blow up in public. Not good. Racing absolutely improved the breed, and for all them stinking nincompoops that were just like always, you know, they, their nose in the air, thinking like, oh, racing this, racing that, they're idiots. Now that's part of the R&D that goes with racing. Uh, you know, there was a reason why we had a bunch of spares, because, you know, we were going through them, but I also felt like that was the best bike for me. Unless you're going to try everything and fail, how do you think you get better at things? The great thing about Jim it was his just his love for racing and his passion for the sport. That's what drove the design. You know, in looking back at every design and everything I did, yes, yeah, some were successful, some were just plain good all American turds, you know. Yes, the Lobos. <laughs> Wasn't a fan of the Lobo. <laughs> the idea was we need to get this thing as low as we can. Everything as low as we can. We need longer arms to get, you know, a better linear, a, a closer to a linear wheel path. Just, I felt like the rear end, I could just never get the rear end to settle down. Yeah, it's going to offer more travel, it's going to get the CG lower, but it wasn't structurally sound. You know, and you can't do that in downhill racing. You know, once you start questioning your equipment or your confidence. It was just the wrong thing. You know, maybe a certain section just can't clear as clean as others, and you're just like, oh man. <laughs> you know, sometimes you throw the dart, it doesn't hit the dart board. It was just constantly evolving, and yeah, there come a point that where we realized that, that the way that bike and all bikes pivoted, you reach a point of limitation. You know, no matter what you do, you, you can't go any further than that. It's like I was thinking about the Lobo and the thermoplastic. They all set out to solve a problem, but there was no supporting cast. You couldn't, you couldn't manufacture a composite, you know, carbon structure for the upper arm. So it became un it, way too difficult to be stable. So the only solution was throw more weight at it. That it kind of that ruins it. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like you don't keep chasing a bad design. And I just took a fresh sheet of paper and said, okay, I, I gotta rethink this. And, and that's when Jimmy had come up with the, the thing called the iDrive. There's no reason that the bottom bracket can't float as an independent body and take the forces that are acting upon the bottom bracket and direct them into the chassis in different environments to cause things to happen to be a better bike. I just said, I'm starting over. I'm gonna suspend the bottom bracket as an independent body. I'm gonna understand, and I spent thousands of hours on, you know, doing, you know, analysis software, just trying to understand every force, and I just watched numbers. When he first showed me the iDrive, I just looked at it and thought this was freaking uh, rocket science stuff. I, I, I couldn't even figure out where that guy came up with it. A couple of guys at the shop goes, what the hell is that? You know, we were all looking at it like it was foreign. It was kept a secret under wraps and then it was finally unveiled to the marketing department, it was unveiled in a substantially different way because even though the RTS was unique and the LTS was unique and required some bullet points to pitch it to people so they could understand it, the iDrive was completely bewildering. 
you can't see what's going on because half the mechanism is hidden. Yeah, I remember the advertising campaign that came along with it. We're just trying to understand it. It's like, what? Unsuspecting enthusiast after another. Everybody that worked on it put their heart and soul into it, and I thought it came out pretty good for what it was. All of its defenders are about to meet that end. It might have been a little over the top. <laughs> It's a very, very good bike, and uh, it's a, it's a great um, step forward for GT. It just makes it, it just makes it a lot easier. It takes less energy to ride farther and faster. Oh, got a lovely bike ride! Yeah! The iDrive bike I thought was amazing. It was so beyond everybody else. It made a good rider a better rider. When I was racing slaloms and four cross and stuff, I would go to every race with with two bikes: a hardtail and a full suspension bike. If it, was a, if it was a faster or a rougher course, um, even like a Sea Otter Dual Solemn, iDrive was, was perfect for that race. So that bike overall was just amazing. I mean, it was a big jump. I didn't even have a, a GT iDrive downhill bike. I borrowed one from the GT R&D department just for that trip. And I remember the first time I rode the shore on a full suspension bike, I was laughing. We want the bicycle to work and uh, there's a lot of classic Jim Busby quotes, but the one I still use to this day is like, he'd say, you gotta let it eat, you know? It's like, don't, because there was so much of this concern about efficiency and, oh, it's moving too much. It's, 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 it's not firm enough. And it's like, our opinion was, you know, if, we're, if you're gonna have a suspension bike, it's gotta work. I was like, I felt like I was sitting on a sofa and somebody pushed me off these rocks and, and drops. It was so plush. And that changed my whole perception and I actually lost a little bit of respect of those free riders from the North Shore because now I go like, hey, on a full suspension bike, it's not as, as gnarly as I thought it would be, you know? <laughs> the DHI is a great example of a bike that, you know, we actually had a lot of failures on the, the track because um, we started going faster and faster and faster. For the time, it was, again, it was cutting edge. Back then, courses weren't as steep and gravity-oriented as they are now. So there was pedaling and acceleration, and there's all these different things that you needed to have, as well as just tracking. The bike was the quietest bike out there. We had to develop, actually, a floating um, chain guide. What we ended up with was a chain guide that was also tracked to the rear triangle. And so now you're coming down the hill, and the, L the, uh, the DHI is like and the bike behind it sounds like the guy's hauling like a, a silverware cabinet. It's like <laughs> And it's hard to go fast on a bike like that. I mean, hands down to so many of those engineers who, who kind of started dialing it in and bringing the technology now to the point where we have it today. That bike solved the riddle. When the iDrive first came out, it, it looked a bit complicated, which, which confused or scared some people. Like, you needed special tools to work on it, and you have to like, you have to like rotate the, the not the bottom bracket, it's just, I can't remember. Yeah, line up the dots thing, you're just like, you're like, ah. The next generation was to try to address those problems. In, in around 2003, 4, you know, we came out with another um, series of iDrive bikes, still the iDrive technology and those bikes were more evolved, they were more simple, they were lighter, you know, they could be all, uh, there was very easy tools, like common tools, like a headset tool and an Allen wrench, you could take the whole thing apart. That's the bottom line, right? Like, kind of make bikes that people can buy and uh, be reliable. That's when we also introduced, like, our first free ride full suspension bike, which was a Ruckus. They all had the iDrive technology back then, and I rode those bikes. I remember taking it to Cuba when we traversed Cuba in the footsteps of Che Guevara. And I think that's one cool thing about the iDrive system. They took this iDrive system and they just kept evolving it and making it better and better and better instead of scrapping it and trying to design something new. But even if, if Busby on paper would say, doesn't work as good as the original, you know what, probably works good enough because it's just about getting people out there without having to have all this like, you know, like you said, like a slide rule and a calculator every time they ride, you know, they're like, well, what's the shock ratio and the spring rate and blah, blah, blah. 
who cares, man? The, the bicycle is supposed to be simple. That's its solution to the world. GT was doing great, especially in uh, 2010, 11, with that you know that series of iDrive, and then again the, the carbon frames, and they just performed so good, lightweight, you know, very little problems and uh, low maintenance. I was also able to uh, be involved with the DHI carbon project, which was awesome. Carbon Fury came out, and that was their new downhill bike, and I think that was like the third rendition of iDrive and it worked awesome. It was also the first carbon downhill frame that they did in a long time. It had been in production for cross-country stuff for a while now, and obviously grow, but gravity, they, it was just like, whoa, man, carbon can't work in gravity. And, uh, well, it did. We, we were one of the first ones to really pioneer that. And it just, it worked incredible. And the riders, all the riders did well. Eric did phenomenal. I thought, you know, you always heard, oh, it's just gonna snap off, man. It catastrophically fails. And, uh, but it was awesome, you know, it was, awesome. again, it was an awesome development process. And it was a lot easier to work on, less moving parts, you know, you still had the same advantage of, you know, the previous iDrive design, but just simplified. The ability to paint the molds with carbon, the graphic design team was really able to accentuate all the nuances and, and the bikes were super sexy and the graphics were cool, it was just, it was awesome, I loved it. Mark Beaumont won on a Carbon Fury in Valdesol, Italy. I believe that was in 2010. And at the time, it was great. I loved the bike. It was cool to be riding carbon. It was cool to be on something new. But, you know, they look like uh, spaceships. Riding for GT has always been something special for me uh, just because my dad uh, rode for GT for uh, a long time and he's still riding with some GT right now. I remember him showing up with the GT T1 which was a diamond bike with a gearbox and there was no drivetrain and it was such a, a special bike. I remember Eric Carter and Brian Lopes racing uh, the Four Cross in Leger in 2004. They were my idols. Then came Steve Peat. I watched him racing in Leger as well, sliding on that last corner before the finish line. And I raced a lot against uh, Nico Vulio as well. And obviously Nico is one of the greatest of all time. So. And especially, you know, for my dad, which raced with him a lot. Um, I think seeing Nico and myself for my dad on the podium together was probably something special. Seeing the progression as well of the brand and being part of it, you know, helping the development of the bike and seeing the progress every year is, you know, something that I really like. We came up with the AOS um, bikes, the sensors and the fours mainly. Uh, Peter Denk was behind it. He's an engineer from Germany who worked for us for many years. And his technology was very new and revolutionary. And it still had a few iDrive patents that were integrated into that, even though we didn't call it iDrive anymore because it was, um, it was different to a big degree. And I was a little bit involved with the testing on that bike. It's making it a smarter system by starting off something that, that was so you know, high up there and then finding ways each year. It's like, well, you know, we can lose, we can take this down and take some weight out or however they did it and just simplifying it. And it was very crucial, the pivot point. One millimeter over would make the bike react completely different. And we would, we had bikes wired with all these wires and sensors and measure it and put a lot of time into dialing it in. You know, it's, it's not dumbing it down, it's actually smarting it up. And a lot of companies I see doing that these days. They'll build something and you're like, oh, that looks cool, you know? And then if it doesn't work, they like, don't go back to the drawing board and try to make that better and then take what works on it and what doesn't work and improve on parts that don't work. They just try to start with something new. They're always catching up, I think. GT has taken this design and they've reconfigured it and given it such a, a long life with the reconfiguration. It's pretty amazing. I think the GT bikes are 
bikes you can get on and get comfortable with very quickly. You know, I've always felt like once you put your foot on the on the new Fury or the new Force or you know any of those new bikes, you straight away feel confident and you can go fast. Good example is Martin. He rode his Fury last year, I think one or two days before he entered the World Cup in La Bresse. Didn't ride at all on the bike. Maybe one day, like maybe a month before practice, first day of practice. Felt comfortable right away, even when we started testing those two days. And you know, three days after, I, I won the, my first downhill World Cup ever. He never had a moment where he did not feel comfortable. And then two weeks after, I was second uh, down in World Champ in Lanzarote. I think those bikes get you in a comfort zone and makes you go fast. At the moment, we're pretty much riding production bikes. We're not on something special that is not available for consumers, and it's the way it should be. Uh, my favorite bike is the Force. Uh, the reason why I like the fall so much is because you can go for a nice cross-country lap uh, on that bike. You can race enduro, um, but you can also go to bike parks and have tons of fun off that bike and pretty much you can do it all. So currently we're racing on the Force, uh, called the 69er with a 650 back wheel, 29er front wheel. That's our favorite enduro bike for sure. And downhill, we have the Fury, which is wow, it's yeah, by far the best downhill bike I've ever had in my hands. If I needed one bike in my garage, that would definitely be the, the Force. Um, the current system is the LTS. It's a bit different from the old LTS. Switching to the LTS, which was such a huge improvement in terms of stability of the bike but also the way the suspension works. You know, myself and all the team could see straight away that uh, the bike was working better and was faster. We work closely with Lewis uh, these days. He's in the telemetry engineer. He listens to the feedback that we give him. He puts it on the computer and it makes the numbers work around that. It's a huge reward for, for us as well, having the engineers listening to what we want and making you know the best possible bike uh, for customers. Just an example is a new Force 29er aluminium. After last season, uh, I had for a few months at home, I could ride the bike, but now the bike is in production and Lewis did everything he could to make the bike the fastest possible. Your bike that you're riding now is better because they're racing this thing today, you know? I was lucky enough to take my adventures all over the globe in every corner and uh, been to over 70 countries and um, the GT bikes were often um, my partner in crime and never once I've had a problem with the bike in the field like where some technology would break, you know, and you like somewhere in the middle of nowhere in the Himalayas where there wouldn't be a GT dealer around the corner, you know. So you had to be able to trust those bikes and those bikes delivered, you know. It's pretty cool that I rode the very first GT full suspension bike ever and Today we're getting ready for the World Championships on one of the most sophisticated bikes out there, the current Fury. And you would put those two bikes next to each other, the way they've come, it's been so much development gone into it. Suspension in mountain biking, I think it will always kind of be centered around that, that current design that GT has right now. Well, GT has come to a point now where both Enduro and Downhill, I truly believe we have some of the best bikes in the world. Wrenching on those bikes, prepping them, getting them ready to race, it's fun. You know you set your riders off with a very good tool to perform. That's what they want. They want to ride down the hill on the best tools available. And when you're confident that you have that in, in your work stand before you send them off, it's, yeah, it's great. Such a huge reward when you cross the finish line and you made it in one piece and you, buy, you feel like your bike helps you a lot um, in those situations and when you push both yourself and the bike together, it's the best feeling ever to cross the finish line.
been around for the last 30 years and it's been fun the whole time, but I think it's never been funner than now because we have better bikes and better trails and better riding styles or techniques, you know, and it's just like, it came to a point that was unimaginable like 30 years ago. Actually, I've always dreamed to go back on a 90s bike uh, with almost no suspension and actually ride the tracks that the guys were riding back in the days and uh, just to see how it feels like and to ride on a 30 or 25 years bike. Having won the first, my first pro downhill race was on a hardtail, like to go from the most simplest bike to then the RTS and then come full circle to ride the LTS, which I, that was pretty much the end of my bike riding. That was fun. For me personally, it feels good to know that you know you were part of that evolution and you were there to kind of go through all that stuff as a R&D athlete. One thing I can tell you with a straight face, and, and I know every bike everybody was on, the bikes that won at every level were available to the consumers. There was nothing special about them. When you can be involved in that process, you know, hey Busby, hey, you know, whoever, like let's change this and do this, and it, those changes occur and then that product ends up being like a really good product and sells really well and you see people out on the trail riding it and they're pumped on it and you know you had a little something to do with it. That's pretty cool. We ride stock bikes and I like to see this inspired people out there go and ride their bikes. We want people to be part of this team and the brand and appreciate the brand. I think I still inspire people or and I, I pioneer my own little segments. Maybe I don't pioneer the extreme segment anymore. I mean, what these guys do now at the Rampage, it's unbelievable. We could have never imagined it. It wasn't just down to the bikes. It was just like, it's the, the talent these kids have. When you see these days, like how much the suspension affects your riding and how much the suspension actually helps you riding fast and eating pretty much anything on the track and you know back in the days it was they had to handle the bike and they couldn't go anywhere like pretty much we do right now. I had a real eye-opener in 2014 I was managing a World Cup team and I had been off the circuit for about eight years and we did a course walk and I was walking with the riders and I thought I was gonna impart this wisdom. Like, I'm gonna tell the, I'm gonna help the guys, and I'm gonna tell them how to take the section. And we crested over this blind rise, and there was this nasty rock garden, and there was a line that was cutting through from the local riders and the local races, and it was this perfect slot. And I was like, guys, we'll set up the turn, and we'll line up, and you're just gonna be able to go through there, no breaks. And, and uh, one of the riders, like, pulled me, and he goes, hey, man, we're gonna jump the whole thing. <laughs> and I, I had to walk back up to the top. I was standing at the bottom at the time, so I walked back to the top and I looked at it, and man, it was like 45 feet blind. And uh, I just I just shook my head and I shut my mouth. You got one mouth and two ears, man. And I used them in that order. And you can't stop the mind, the athletes. And that's why, you know, Carter for title, that's why I still say champ whenever I see him. Because, man, when you're a freaking champion, you deserve it and you should be recognized as a champion. And so for even for the athletes that aren't champions but are still pulling those kind of tricks, man, it's like you have nothing but respect because who in their right mind would do that kind of stuff? And luckily there's a bicycle there to make them do it. I guess somebody had to start somewhere and show them what's possible and then from there they take it, you know, but um, it's, it's, been, it's been an honor and, uh, and you know, I'm living, living, the, living my dream. Back in the day, this was like my first jersey, I think. A long time ago. Pretty fun. You know, I've been doing this for 46, 47 years. And um, I'm, <clears throat> I never stop feeling good when somebody comes up and, you know, pats me on the back and tells me what they thought, what they've done. We all had the passion from, from the people that worked at the company to the racers, I think just GT, anybody that was at GT had passion for winning and for racing and, and it showed through everything we did. 
to this day, I mean, you know, I'm still always in awe of, of, of all the things we accomplished. <clears throat> I'm no longer with GT, but, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to bleed blue and yellow. Whether we are at the apex of the racing, I don't, that's not for me to judge, but I know it changed my life, um, without a doubt. I don't know what I would have become. <laughs> yeah, I was 15 years old, the first contract I've signed with them, and it's been seven years now already that I'm riding for GT, and you know, it makes me just push myself even more at the races, just because I love the brand, and I love everyone working at the company as well, and they've always been so nice to me that you know, I just want to give it back to them uh, when I'm racing. How proud of you are you of the that so many people kind of accomplished their personal goals and thousands of people and hundreds of thousands of people that have enjoyed cycling based on technology that you developed in your career at GT. How does that make you feel? Hundreds, if not millions of people. I know, I mean, I, grateful. Just grateful. I, we go again. I don't know, it's just, that's just how I am as a person, you know, and having people, you know, just be happy that I was part of it. It isn't about money, it isn't about anything. It's about, are you happy at the end of the day when you put your head on your pillow? And that's all you'd want. And if my bike helped you, I, you know, that's, that's all I was looking for. Cut. Because I think everyone else was getting custom. Wasn't that it? All I did was let a couple months pass and then gave you another shy and you're like, yeah, this is so much better. But you know what? If I didn't ask for that custom, I wouldn't have had the idea for the Giovanna. No, I don't. That, that's it. That's Wrong. It. That's okay. The story. Here we are. Hold it down like this. So it wasn't custom? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, what do you think? Listen, I was the person that would be on the start line like, how much air do you have? I'm yeah, going to change it. Exactly. Okay. Or how is your position on that bike? I think I need to change my... You oh, look really good on that bike. Julie, why are you raising your seat now? Because I oh, saw really someone. Self, were you self-conscious of what? I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just like, I had no firm, like, wow, look at that. Okay, that looks like a good position on the bike. I'll just do that. You know, she spoke about how she has no technology. Clueless. You know, it was awesome. I remember one time at uh, one day, uh, Simon's was there. Paul, it's either Turner, Simon's probably Paul, was uh, they were put, building up a bike for her to ride before Big Bear, and they pumped up her fork to just like to like to set up the fork with like 100 psi in each leg. You know. And then she went off and did like a pre lab the pre rolled the course, you know, and came back. How is it, Julie? Oh, it was perfect. Oh, I loved it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Turner's just like, oh my God. You know, it's like we didn't know who, no one, you know, took the air out and actually set the fork up for. She didn't know the difference, you know, it's just like, and I was just like, <laughs> oh, it was awesome. So on your RTS, it was it's changing it all the time. Uh, travel, droop, sag, rebound, those? I don't even know what it is today. I was in a meeting with Santa Cruz about the Juliana. I go in, so on the double suspension, double pivot, and they, they go, do you even know what we do here? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so Julie, what are you holding there? Is this mine? Sure. I believe it is. Okay. Um, looks like the place card for uh, the world champion at Bromont. Canadian club. There's 14-year-old junior kids that are doing those things, man. It's it's phenomenal, and it's evolution, right? There's a song about evolution, baby. It's evolution, man, and it, it's awesome to see. I'm glad I was a part of it. I'm grateful that I'm standing on the outside of the tape now. <laughs>